Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. In these days of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're disseminating as much high-quality, evidence-based information and expert opinion about the situation as we can in our special bonus COVID-19 episodes. Meanwhile, we still want to support you in your nursing career development, so please enjoy this interview recorded prior to this global emergency. Be well, stay safe, and many blessings on you, your loved ones, your colleagues, your communities, and everyone on this troubled yet beautiful planet of ours. Why are stories and storytelling so crucial to nurses and the profession of nursing? Let's talk all about it with nurse storyteller Lisa Labrie right here on this special bonus episode of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello and welcome to the Nurse Keith Show. I love having you along for this ride, whether you're new to the show or you've been hanging out with me here on the airwaves for months or years. I thank you for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. You probably know this already, but this podcast is all about you and your nursing career, and I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most fascinating and inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, medicine, entrepreneurship, and beyond. And did you know that Nurse Keith Coaching is your one-stop shop for all things related to your career? That's right. I offer individualized career coaching for nurses and healthcare professionals around the world. And if you mention that you're a listener, you get 10% off your first coaching package. So email me today at Keith at NurseKeith.com and we can schedule a complimentary consult to chat and explore how coaching can help you have the most satisfying life and career possible. And today we're welcoming friend of the pod, Lisa Labrie. And Lisa, I thank you for being here. And I want to jump right in. Now, you are really, really interested in stories. So tell me, why are stories so important to nurses and the profession? Thank you so much, Keith, for having me on. Um, Storytelling is really important to me personally, And I think it's really important to the nursing profession. When I became a new nurse in 2004, I was 100% committed and passionate about my career, but I really didn't understand how much it would affect me personally, emotionally. And I worked in pediatric oncology for the first five years. And one of the things I realized is that I had all of these stories of people's lives and nowhere to put them. So I would leave work at the end of my shift, like, like go out into the world, go to the grocery store. I know there's a kid dying of cancer right now, but I'm going to act like nothing's happening. And so I really felt like it was important to me to find a place to put that. So I initially started with like a personal journal. Um, But today I have a podcast, the LAMP podcast, and I do live storytelling events with caregivers because I realize there's a need for other people to get these stories out and share them and find out they're not alone. Wow, that's a beautiful way to look at it. And tell me a little bit more, like, what can we learn from hearing the stories of our colleagues and our patients? What what comes out of that process for us? And how do we benefit? There's two, like, separate areas that are going to be beneficial. One is for the public. Um, and, and this is that idea that the public often looks, you know, we're the most trusted profession, uh, voted repeatedly, and the public often looks at nurses as angels or heroes, um, kind of like sort of singularly one-dimensional without any humanistic qualities. We, we don't get to be, you know, having a bad day or having a difficult time or or having more to us than just this idea of, you know, angels or heroes. And so I think it's really important for the public to understand more about the profession of nurses. We're not often represented in media in different ways, um, the way that most like television shows feature primarily physicians um, doing all of the care at the hospital. So I think it's beneficial to, to have people hear nurses in that light. Inside of nursing, I think it's really empowering to have people have an opportunity to use their voice to tell their own story. Um, And I also think it's empowering for other people hearing to realize that they're not alone in their experiences and the things that they struggle with in this profession are shared across the profession. 
I see. Now your your podcast is called The Lamp, mm-hmm. and it is available at the Lamp dot podcast on Instagram and on Twitter. It's at Lamp Podcast, and we'll also have a link in the show notes to the website, which is the Lamp dot Blueberry dot net, and that's B L U B R R Y Blueberry dot net. So it also be on iTunes. People can find it all over the place. So. It just launched on March 21st, so you're, it's brand new on the scene. And what are you hoping that this podcast might do for people who tune in? Well, I'm really hoping that people will be able to listen to the stories of the, the nurses that I've recorded so far um, and any other future profession, because I'm opening it up to caregivers across professions, but right now, primarily it's nurses. Um, I'm hoping they'll be able to listen to it and understand that the difficulties they're experiencing are not isolated to them alone, you know, that the other people are experiencing the same things. And I also hope that it will give them an opportunity to listen to other people talking about what they went through and how they managed it and how it affected them and give them some insight into their own experiences Um, I also hope it creates a stronger sense of community among nurses. You know, there's a big push now in a lot of social media platforms and across conferences about self-care, resilience, managing burnout. And it's all needed because we're, you know, realizing how important it is and what a struggle it is in the face of, you know, exercising tremendous amount of emotional labor in our profession. So I'm hoping it gives uh, another added support and another added space for community for, for healthcare professionals. Mm. Can you reflect on the concept of emotional labor? You just brought that up. I've written and talked about it before, but I want to hear your take on what that actually means. Cause some people listening might not quite understand that term. Yeah. So emotional labor has been written about, for some time, and it's usually talked about across public-facing professions, um, so anyone who really has intensive work with the public, which, you know, obviously is essential for nursing, that we have public-facing um, profession. And emotional labor is emotional work. It's the part of the work in which you have to create emotions or push down the emotions that you're feeling in any given situation in order to create empathy and compassion, um, to have patience and understanding, to engage in active listening, therapeutic conversations. Um, so that's kind of what how I view emotional labor. I always see emotional labor as, right, it's, it's everything that happens to us as caregivers and nurses and healthcare professionals and the things we witness and the things we feel and, and how heavy duty our work can be on, you know, to use a very simplistic term. Mm -hmm. But I also think about secondary trauma. You know, we all take on, or we all can take on trauma because, you know, you're witnessing that dying child and that has an impact on you. I mean, sure, Mm -hmm. you can go home and make laundry and hug your, uh, do laundry and make dinner and hug your kids. But that boy who's dying on the oncology floor is still on your mind, right? And you're carrying his story with you in a certain respect, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I kind of view compassion as the fundamental tool in the nurse's tool belt, you know, be way beyond the tasks that you might do in your daily job because they vary across practices, you know, depending where you are. But compassion is fundamental and it's a, you know, it's a source that can be depleted. But I think to really specify emotional labor, it's important to understand that you have to produce an emotional state and it may not match what you're feeling. So this also applies to when, you know, maybe you're going through something personally at home and you're distraught, but you have to go to work and put on your, you know, I'm here to help you, compassionate nurse. I'm 100% engaged. So so it, it has that kind of component of it. You have to create an emotional state that you may feel or you may not feel. And also, if you're angry or upset, we always have to push that down to do something. So maybe you had a, like a 
conflict with a coworker or a difficult interaction with someone else, when you go into the next patient's room, you kind of have to push that down and be ready to engage with the patient in a in the appropriate emotional state. You know, I understand that you've been a nurse since 2004 and you have a ADN, you have a BSN, you also have a degree in English literature and language, and then you have an MA in teaching English as a second of foreign language. So you're an educator, you're a speaker, now you're a podcaster, you're a nurse, you've been a nurse for quite some time now, you know, going on two decades, right? So you've been around the block. And I understand looking at your resume on LinkedIn that your first job was at City of Hope as a clinical nurse working with children with cancer. So I think that's why you brought that, you brought that example up. And I understand as well that, you know, you as an educator see that as we prepare nurses in the educational system, you know, we're churning out nurses all the time, right? Out of nursing schools all over the country and all over the world. You have said to me, in writing that you feel like there's not much discussion within nursing education of how our work actually impacts us emotionally and or let's say spiritually. So do you feel like there's something we can do, like really make a change to create a better, for lack of a better term, a better playing field for nurses in this kind of emotional and spiritual psychological realm? Yeah, I think this is something that we absolutely need to address. Um, There's some research about the relationship of increased emotional labor and emotional exhaustion and fatigue in nurses. And some of that research shows that it's higher when you have highly idealistic nurses, um, less experienced nurses or younger nurses. And sometimes younger is under 30. Sometimes it's like under 35 in depending on the study. But there's this relationship between this increased need for emotional labor and not yet having the skills to manage it. And so why are we waiting until people are already on the job to start developing that skill? Why aren't we doing it in school? You know, when we're training nurses, we talk to them about how our patients respond to certain situations. We talk to them about grief in the patient population and their family members. But we don't talk about it in ourselves and how our work affects us emotionally. And I know that in the UK, they've had like some studies that in the recommendations, they were calling for emotional curriculum to be added, like emotional literacy for their professional nurses. And because they're struggling also with the same, you know, nursing is the same across the world. Everyone's struggling with the same professional issues. But the UK uniquely is really struggling with like a heavy amount of burnout um, where they lost like 18,000 nurses in like 2017 and 2018. Whoa. Yeah. 18,000? According, yeah. According to one article that I read. Okay. I mean, some of that could be a little bit of retirement, but. A lot of it was cited as their primary reason was like work-life imbalance and, and some of the stresses they face on the job. Okay. So do you have a story that you'd like to point us to or a story that stands out in your mind of one of the nurses you've spoken to or interacted with that you feel like illustrates some of these issues that are really front and center for you right now? Um, So I did, I did one um, story narrative that was recorded for my podcast from a nurse um, that I thought was really striking. And I know that there are people who relate to this. She was talking about just being so miserable at work and not knowing what to do about it that as she drove to work, she imagined getting into a car accident, not to like have serious injury, but an injury enough that she wouldn't have to go to work. And I've heard other nurses say that, or they like imagine, what if I got in a car accident and I didn't have to go to work for the rest of the week? She even said like, I didn't want to be, you know, seriously harmed, but I was literally crying thinking about going to work. And so you know, it seemed like if it was a mild car accident where I couldn't go to work for the rest of the week, that might be good. 
Yeah. Um, these are, but these are the thoughts that sometimes people are having when they're struggling to cope with the mm-hmm. difficulties of their job and they don't know where to go or who to talk to about it. Obviously I don't want anyone to get in a car accident on the way to work at all. Nor do I. Right. So it's sort of maddening this conundrum of nurses seen as angels or superheroes, which like you've told me offline that it's such a two dimensional view of who we are. Cause it kind of strips us of our humanity and makes us into these like superhuman or, or these non-human people who do this amazing work and a heavy lift in the world and everything. And we're supporting everyone, but people don't see that we're suffering too. Mm-hmm. So you talk about secondary trauma, you talk about the effect on nurses emotionally or spiritually or psychologically. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned also in some of the stuff you sent to me for me to review before interviewing you, and I appreciate that a lot, is that we always talk about how we manage the grief of the patient or the family, right? We have Mm -hmm. Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, which we know are non-linear, et cetera, et cetera. But when do we ever talk about the grief of the nurse, the cumulative grief? Does that ever happen? Um, I think, I don't know about how, if anyone has felt their program has introduced it. I've been introducing it um, to my students in like sneaky ways because it's not formally part of the curriculum. So I teach a research writing class and my students get to choose a topic in healthcare that they stay with for the whole term and and view from various angles. So I give them the opportunity to choose um, compassion fatigue or grief in nursing as a topic. And so I'll usually get like one student, two students a term who will pick it, but that's really limited because you're only like affecting the person who chooses to study it. I think it it is something we have to talk to more to students because death and dying is a part of the job we do. And for some of us, we know our patients a short time. Some of us know our patients for a long time, but no matter what, those are real humans we take care of. And it's inherently tied to our compassion to see them as real humans. Mm -hmm. But we also have to deal with the, the feelings we have around the loss of those patients. And in various places in the hospital, people deal with different aspects of this, like moral distress and difficult decision making at the end of life in the ICU. Um, So a lot of people have higher rates of burnout when they have um, greater feelings of prolong, you know, difficulty with prolonging life unnecessarily or that they don't agree with like the treatment continuing even though there's no added benefit for the patient and these are issues that are difficult to to manage not just from the ethical framework which we i think we do put into nursing programs Mm -hmm. but from the emotional aspect of what it means to sit with that every day through your shift right right gosh there's so much nurses sit with right there's you know we hear about burnout, compassion fatigue. We hear about physician suicide, for instance, you know, apparently one physician on average commits suicide a day in the United States. And we don't have specific data on nurses, but we know that the suffering is there, right? And we know that, that how nurses are viewed is, like we said, pretty two dimensional. So this idea of storytelling and bringing these stories to the fore is brilliant. And I'm really glad you're doing this. And I, I just can't wait to continue to, to, to support and publicize and get your podcast out there because I think these stories are helpful. And when we come back from a really quick break, I want to talk about a Ted talk that you feel really illustrates this issue around having one single narrative about a group that really limits the way we see them. And then I also just want to talk about a little more about this educational aspect of nursing, how we prepare nurses better for the emotional labor and everything else that we face that we've been talking about. And then a few other things along the way that it's just you're an expert in these areas and i'd like to dig a little deeper so we'll be right back with the second half of this special bonus episode of the nurse keith show 
So now we're going to take a pause for the cause for just a moment. Please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Nurse Keith. And if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me, please consider referring them. And if they become a paying client, you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me. And there's no expiration date on that credit, so you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most. And remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits. What an incredible deal. And please head over to NurseKeith.com and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages, updates from my blog and my podcast, resources, and all sorts of other stuff. Remember, NurseKeith.com, sign up for that newsletter, and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you. Anyway, those are my sincere asks today. So now, Let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. Well, welcome back to the second half of the episode. The show notes for this episode are going to be at nursekeith.com forward slash the lamp. That will be the episode URL. So please go there for the show notes to learn all about Lisa. And we're here again with Lisa Labrie. And Lisa, prior to the break, we were talking about emotional labor and the ways in which nurses are seen in two-dimensional ways, et cetera, and also how education of nurses could change. And you're doing it very sneakily, which I think is really wonderful. And I can't wait till you're like a dean of nursing of a major nursing school and you just like shake it all up from top to bottom and create a new curriculum. But that's another conversation. So let me know when you're Dean. Okay. Um, but first of all, you mentioned to me that there's a Ted talk. It is apparently it's not by a nurse, but this Ted talk is emblematic of something for you. Can you explain how this Ted talk represents what you want to get across to the audience? Yeah, there's a, a Ted talk, um, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She's a Nigerian writer, um, and she wrote, um, maybe the audience may have read one of her books, but one of them that's well known is Americana. And she did this TED talk on the danger of a single story. And she's really talking about the continent of Africa and, and being viewed very singular, singularly and the problem with that. Um, as a Nigerian writer, when she came to the U.S. to study, she talks about how her roommate was like, do you have, you know, do you have tapes? And this is, you know, the time when people listen to tapes um, for music. And she's like, of course I have tapes. Of course I have Madonna. Mm -hmm. And her roommate is like, oh, but you're from Africa. I didn't think you would have like electricity or, you know. So this idea of seeing Africa as a continent singularly, which actually comes up in my nursing class all the time. I always have students who will write countries like China, India, and Africa. And I have to correct that in their paper and say, Africa is not a country. Mm -hmm. It's a continent. <laughs> and so she was really illustrating this idea that you can't look at an entire continent of people as one narrative, one single story. It's limiting um, and it doesn't allow for them to be fully human and fully, you know, authentically who they are in their diverse and beautiful ways. Mm. I think the same thing is true for this idea of nurses as just angels or nurses as heroes is that it limits how we see the people who do this work and that they deserve to be fully fleshed out human beings who have human experiences and they should be able to acknowledge and express their emotions and their feelings about their work. That's a very, very good point. And we will have a link to that TED Talk in the show notes 
and I have it right here on my computer bookmarked. So I'm going to watch that. We're going to we're going to encourage everyone who's listening to watch it because this illustrates your point. And there's many, many more videos of her that you can find on YouTube. So there's plenty out there if you you are quite interested in this particular author and storyteller. So Lisa, with your podcast, are you going to be interviewing or or featuring, you're not interviewing, featuring stories of only nurses and healthcare providers? Or do you picture it having a broader scope? What What's the plan for the podcast in this first iteration? So the first season has 10 episodes. And I know a lot of nurses. So all of the first narratives that are featured are from nurses. But I really think that I'd like to open it up across um, other groups of people of caregivers. It's really focused on, you know, shining a light on the stories of caregivers. So I'd really like to open it up broader. And I also am looking in the future to also do some international or bilingual storytelling. I'd like to offer some of these stories in more than one language. So if somebody's bilingual and told the story in English in another language, I think it'd be a great opportunity because I think, like I said, these issues are faced by professional caregivers around the world. It's not isolated to just our own unique, you know, American experience. Okay. And here in the United States, in terms of nurses, we, we know what a lot of the struggles are, right? We have understaffing, we have high nurse patient ratios, we have the emotional labor aspect of nurses, we have the physical labor, right? Nursing can be very tiring, especially if you're on a like a busy hospital floor, but even working in school nursing or a clinic or, or hospice or home health, there's a lot of running around. So it can be physically tiring, emotionally exhausting, spiritually dispiriting, I guess you could say, but there's a lot of joys in nursing too. And do you hope that your stories can elucidate all those aspects of the profession and how those stories can illustrate that for people who who are listening? Yeah, absolutely. There, There is an aspect of this that we, we haven't actually touched on, and that's compassion satisfaction. And that's the term for the good things that we get out of caring for others, um, the motivation, the personal accomplishment, the energy we get from other people. And so I want all, I want all of that to come through. This isn't just a podcast about, you know, what's wrong in nursing. It, there are like personal narratives of people overcoming insane odds. And I, like, I have one story of a, a nurse who was a flight nurse who was out to pick up a patient in the field and experienced sudden cardiac arrest that was idiopathic cardiomyopathy, no known cause. And everything that happened to keep him alive today is an amazing story. Wait till you hear it. Oh, it's amazing. It's, it's so amazing. I can't wait. So he had a cardiac event on the way to work? No, at work. Well, he, because he's a flight nurse and he's picking up a patient in the field and they're putting the patient on the helicopter. And then all of a sudden he's like, I couldn't breathe. Oh, okay. Right. So he was with his colleagues actually as a flight nurse. Oh my gosh. Okay. So can we take a step back for a second? So Compassion satisfaction. I have never heard that term. I've heard compassion fatigue, of course, everybody talks about that. But compassion satisfaction. So is that in essence like the opposite of compassion fatigue? Um, I think, I guess, yeah, you could frame it that way. But I, I usually usually define it as like the good things that we get out of our work. I mean, it's the reason why people went into nursing usually, right? I want to help people. I want to make a difference. There's a lot of um, research on how, what kind of good feelings you get out of volunteering or working, you know, at a shelter or this, you know, those kind of things, what they do for us to help others. And that's the same reason why people went into nursing. So it's that satisfaction they get out of their work. Also, they get satisfaction out of the personal accomplishment of doing something complex or learning new skills um, that make a difference in the world. Mm. And I think this idea is fairly old because I know like the first time I was introduced to any of these concepts was 
when I went to a conference and the speaker mentioned a book, um, it's called Self-Healing Through Reflection by Bush and Boyle. So the two authors, Bush and Boyle wrote it. And, and that's where the sort of, I got a, like a basic foundation of understanding of all these concepts. I picked up the book cause I was like, compassion fatigue. Wait, I think that's me. Mm, right. Of course. Right. So Self-Healing Through Reflection by Bush and Boyle. So we will have mm-hmm. a link to that as well in the show notes from, for Amazon. It looks like a lovely book. It's actually called Self-Healing Through Reflection, a Workbook for Nurses. Is that the book you're referring to? Yeah, it is a workbook. So it has like awesome exercises you can do. It has a copy of the ProQual Quality of Life um, survey to see where you rate on compassion, satisfaction, compassion fatigue or secondary traumatic stress. So you can do like a self-assessment. Perfect. Okay. We will have a link to that in the show notes. So tell me a little more about your own experience, if you don't mind, in terms of you mentioned realizing that you were burnt out or you were experiencing compassion fatigue. So when you realized you were in that place, what was one of the first things you decided you needed to do in order to turn that around? Do you have a secret or a story or a strategy that you feel really moved the needle for you personally? So I'll start with when I realized, because realizing and then actually doing a good chunk of the work, there was a kind of a gap in between. Um, I think I was experiencing compassion fatigue for a while, but I didn't know what it was until I went to this, you know, it was a oncology nursing conference because all of my work has been primarily in oncology and hematology, mostly bone marrow transplant. Okay. So I went to this conference and the, uh, there was a speaker who started the talk with this question of like, how many people did you take care of this month who died now times that by 12 months, now times that by how many years you've been a nurse. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of people. Hmm. Kind of an average guesstimate of, you know, like the amount of people that you've cared for who died. And so then she goes into talking about, you know, compassion fatigue and grief and how it's a, a normal reaction to cumulative loss. And so this was like the first time that somebody's saying like, oh, what I'm feeling out loud in a room. And I was like, ah, give me the book, sign me up. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, if I think back to my days of working in the, the AIDS community, you know, caring for people with HIV and AIDS and other conditions that are often, you know, associated other comorbidities, boy, if I sat down to make a list of all the people I cared for and really loved and cared about who died, it would be a long list. You know, and it makes me think of this amazing physician who ran this incredible community, uh, federally qualified community health center in Springfield, Massachusetts, back in the day. His name was Jeff Scavron, and he was a real radical doctor back in the 60s. He was even like personal physician to the Black Panthers, like back in the 60s. So he'd been very progressive. And I remember you bringing this to mind just made me think of the story of how Dr. Scavron, who I just adored, and we worked so well together, and he's such a compassionate, kind man. He had a list next to his desk where every time one of our patients died, he would write the patient's name and the date of death on it. And do you know how many pages there were on his bulletin board stuck together with all the names of the people who died from the community health center? It was outrageous. And he could remember almost every single patient. And that was one of my first lessons as a newish nurse of, whoa, look at the consequences of the work we do. So in your experience personally or people who you've encountered or your students or maybe the people you've begun collecting stories of, do you feel like there's anyone out there who you've encountered so far who really has a, I don't want to say a silver bullet because there's no single fix to any of these situations, right? Or any of these feelings or experiences. Is there a person out there who you've encountered whose story really illustrates this notion of being able to work through and overcome 
this trauma and grief and come out the other side? Well, I think like you're saying, there is no silver bullet. And I think it's multifactorial and layered. Every individual person experiencing some aspect of the burnout spectrum has to do kind of that inside work of like, what's the root cause? For me, compassion fatigue was a big part of it. So was, um, I had some negative perfectionism, these like unrealistic standards for myself that are um, kind of encouraged in healthcare ex extrinsically, but also were really strong intrinsically. Um, so that was my own aspect. Um, if you have a history of personal trauma, it can make you higher risk for secondary traumatic stress, which I have personal history of trauma. I grew up with like a mentally ill parent. And so all of these things uh, that I learned about, I had to start figuring out how to work through. I think there are some really great people to look to today who have a good grasp on the kind of complex changes we need to make, but also talk about the systematic changes. So like on Instagram, if you look at Anna from the burnout book, she does a great job of talking about this from an organization standpoint, as well as an individual standpoint. Also, I recommend the Burnout to Lit Up podcast, which is hosted by um, Erica and her husband from Joy Energy Time on Instagram. It's a great podcast, that, and they regularly talk to different people about different aspects of burnout. Um, Erica and her husband are a OTPT team, so they're coming from the OTPT world, but they still talk with people across health professions. Ooh, okay. Thank you for cluing me in and any audience member out there who that really lights them up to think about that. Um, the Burnout to Lit Up podcast, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And Anna from the Burnout book, yes, I follow her closely on Instagram. So she's doing some great work out there too. And let's circle back as we begin to wind down this idea of negative perfectionism. You told me prior to our recording that it's actually per associated with anxiety. And I think I experience a lot of negative perfectionism now in my life and also when I was an active clinician, which mm -hmm. I'm not right now. So tell us a little more about negative perfectionism and the ripple effects in someone's life or work when that's one of the like, what would you say, engines that drives them? Yeah. Um, perfectionism in, in various uh, scholarly articles, sometimes it's like they talk about positive perfectionism and negative perfectionism. Some people say healthy perfectionism and unhealthy per perfectionism. But there's this idea that if you have um, the positive or healthy perfectionism, you're striving to always improve and your well-being. So with positive perfectionism, your well-being is positively affected by your perfectionism. Um, so you get a lot of reinforcement and feel good about your work, but you don't take not meeting the mark as, you know, a failure with severe consequences. That's not how positive perfectionism is. And negative perfectionism is kind of viewed as these unrealistic standards that, that, um, causes a decrease in your well-being. So some studies show higher anxiety or increased depression associated with negative perfectionism. And these are also in nursing students and across the healthcare profession. So they look at that in doctors too. And some of it is, like I said, intrinsic or extrinsic. So it could be like self perfectionism like inside you ha you have the message like I need to get it done I need to have it be perfect and some of it is like social or coming external and so that could be from the kind of workplace you know that the culture of the workplace that you work in and I think that is a hard thing in healthcare because we do want the greater good for the patient and we do want the best outcomes but there are definitely places that I've worked where the atmosphere seems like there's no, no room for error ever. And, and the reality is it can never be perfect. So what happens to the person who's a part of the error? Like, how do they walk away from it if there's no room for error ever? Do you know what I'm saying? 
That's a very good point. And I'm guilty. <laughs> guilty is charged. I mean, my perfectionism has caused me all sorts of issues throughout my life. And now that you've mentioned it, I have never thought about it in these terms. And you are blowing my mind today, Lisa, is that, um, honestly, that I believe my negative perfectionism has led to a great deal of anxiety throughout my life and burnout in various work situations, one of which I'm thinking of in, in specifically. So, um, boy, one is <laughs> one reaction from me is that, boy, Lisa Labrie needs to be really, really famous because <laughs> this information needs to get out there. So it does need to get I'm out picturing, there. I don't know if I need I'm to be picturing, famous, but it does. Oh, come on. I'm picturing the Lamp podcast being humongo, and I'm picturing you being on Fresh Air with Terry Gross on NPR and talking on the Dr. Oz show and like just writing an amazing book that just pulls all this together. So I'm already planning your entire career from now. So I don't know how old you are, but you know, I have your next 20 years planned out. So we'll, we'll talk about that after. Well, you are the coach. <laughs> so if anyone can I am help the coach. me get there. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, you really are blowing my mind because I'm actually using what you're saying. Like I said a moment ago, to reflect on my own issues. And I'm very transparent about my issues here on the show. And, you know, depression, burnout, PTSD, anxiety, I've got it all on board. And I think there's probably at least one person listening to this podcast of the hundreds tuning in who are probably in the same place or have been or will be. So I think what you're doing here is super, super important. And is there anything we haven't touched on before we say goodbye, that you would like to communicate to that one person in the audience who who needs the message? Is there one more thing on your mind? You know, you mentioned PTSD, and I think it's, okay. it's valuable to note that when we were talking about trauma and we were talking about secondary traumatic stress, the symptoms that you exhibit for secondary traumatic stress are the same symptoms of PTSD. And some people have experienced it different. So it can be hypervigilance. It can, it can be like exaggerated startle reflex. It can be difficulty sleeping. It can be nightmares. It also can be over involvement in patients. And I think oh, that yes. is something that all of us have known that nurse who's overly involved in the patient who calls after their home to check on them who wants to check their chart you know later and always keep up to date with what's going on with them even though they're no longer a part of their care um, and i'm not saying just because you know this one time you wanted to find out what happened that means you have sts but looking at that kind of comprehensively might make people realize they're more affected by their work than they thought my husband's also a nurse and we've had, he works in the cath lab and we've definitely had conversations about the intensity of, you know, emergencies in the cath lab and what he carries home. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have, I have no doubt. So I'm glad your husband's there too. I'm glad he's in your corner and you all can talk about this stuff because it's, it's crucial. And I, I'm sure it informs all of the things you, you talk about on your podcast and in the work you're doing and in that amazing book you're going to write and the Ted talk and your interview with Terry Gross on NPR. I mean, you know, you got a lot of work cut out for you and I'm glad your husband is, you know, <laughs> in the game, in the game with you. So if people want to find you, I know they can go to, the lamp.blueberry.net that's b l u b r r y the lamp at blueberry.net they can also find you on instagram twitter and you have a profile on linkedin and they can also go to the whole right mm -hmm. and i just signed up for your newsletter at the whole nurse so will the podcast also be archived at the whole nurse.com i'm not sure about that yet if i'm going to okay. connect them for sure okay. i'm going to have the lamp blueberry.net good okay so people can find it there so lisa this has been very enlightening like i said you've blown my mind it's given me a lot of food for thought even right now in the work i do as a coach and supporting all the people that i support and thank you for bringing this to light and i hope the lamp just takes off and people really 
get what you're after here and that this this narrative that you're creating is really hopefully going to change a lot of people's lives out there and maybe even change nursing education and how we approach it. So thanks for doing all this awesome work and having you here is just such a, such a blessing and pleasure. And I really honor you for what you're doing. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about my favorite topic. (laughs) My pleasure and honor entirely. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this such inspiring episode of The Nurse Keith Show. Please remember that the show notes can be found at nursekeith.com forward slash the lamp. This is a special bonus episode. I hope you feel uplifted, empowered, inspired from this episode. And I encourage you to take whatever actions you need to every day in the interest of your personal wellness, your professional satisfaction, and living the life you truly want to live. And if you need personalized holistic career coaching, Remember, don't look any further than nursekeith.com. Mention the show and get a 10% discount on your first coaching package. And remember that over at nursekeith.com in the drop down resources menu, there are job listings from Reload, Trusted Health, Incredible Health, ZipRecruiter, and lots of other resources to check out, including free ACLS, BLS, and PAL certification. Who couldn't use that? And OpenMD, a free search engine for evidence based medicine and information just for you and your clinical practice. The Nurse Keith Show is adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting, and Mark Kapaspisen is our stalwart social media ringmaster. I'm grateful to both Rob and Mark for keeping the wheels turning in the right direction and relieving me of any secondary podcasting trauma that happens along the way. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful and so cold Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the amazing Lisa Labrie bidding you adieu from sunny LA. Sunny LA. Lisa, thank you so much, and we will catch everyone next time.